Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic. Today's guest is clinical psychologist, Dr. Caitlin Harkness, who's done research into yoga, looking at the empirical evidence for positive outcomes with practice. Caitlin really knows her stuff. It's quite incredible looking at the inflammation response, biological markers, epigenetic change. This is really an episode episode worth listening to, so enjoy. A very big welcome to you, Caitlin, on Better Thinking. Today's topic is obviously yoga, one of your specialties and passions, and and what I'm really interested in finding out more about you uh, and from you is this empirical space. You know, so many of us talk about yoga and its benefits. I know that my wife's been kind of uh, asking me to participate for some time and it's a bit of a in-house joke that continues on. Uh, so we'll make sure she doesn't get a copy of this, but there's, there, there's clearly empirical you know, evidence and, and research that uh, talks about that. And I think it's nice to um, hear, hear from someone who's in the know. So thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. I um, I didn't know that your wife was such a yogi, so I might make it my personal mission to stack the evidence. So <laughs> by the end of this episode, you are heading off to the yoga mat with her. I might just end it right there. So thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yoga. Obviously, it's a passion. How did you get into it? And then what, what, what took you on that journey of actually doing some research behind it? Yeah, so I guess I got into it in a rather roundabout way. It wasn't something that I grew up with or that I had, you know, any particular sway to go and try myself, but I was doing my undergrad in philosophy and I really liked philosophy and I really liked my philosophy tutor and my philosophy tutor was a yoga instructor. So our little tutorial group um, kind of, I guess, got persuaded to go and do a yoga class in this like dingy community hall with him. And I thought it was okay. Um, but then I kept running and I kept, you know, noticing my hamstrings were getting tighter and I was thinking I should do some stretching, but I didn't like stretching. So I went to go do some organized stretching in the city I'd moved to for university. And I stumbled into this yoga studio that was like dingy again and in this basement and like dim lighting. And I thought this place is disgusting. And I did the practice and I loved it. And I went back every day. Um, so that was the way I found I found yoga. And what I noticed happening was that my emotional well-being and my capacity to cope with my studies and the stressors that came with that through this practice of yoga seemed enhanced and improved. I just felt like I was tuning into uh, a different version of myself or like I had a different resiliency than I'd experienced in the past. So I was really interested in this and motivated. So I went and completed a yoga teacher training. And then interestingly enough, as I was teaching, other students started sharing with me their experience of yoga and these transformative effects that this practice they perceived to be having in their life. So I thought that was interesting. I finished my um, philosophy studies, found no work as a philosopher, and <laughs> continued teaching yoga for That's a while. Odd. That's odd. <laughs> you know, isn't it just, I pictured myself having a pipe and being in a cafe, but it didn't really go anywhere. So I, um, I guess I was reading a lot on yoga and psychology, just from personal interest and, and nerding out a little bit, you know, highlighting and bookmarking and 
my housemates sort of suggested that maybe I might want to do something about this interest of mine that was becoming a full-time research hobby. And I ended up looking into psychology and coming back to study. I actually, um, I'm from Canada, so I moved here to Australia and did my PhD in clinical psychology here in Adelaide and actually looked at whether yoga could be used as an intervention for pe people experiencing high levels of stress, psychological distress. And I, I guess I was really impressed by the results. It probably validated something that in my heart I thought might be true. It had been my experience. It had been the stories that people had passed down. But seeing that research evidence, I think, was really powerful. It's so important because obviously there are so many practices out there and there's, there, there's certainly antidotal evidence um, and you know, there, there, there are whole industries that are, that, that are based on antidotal evidence um, but they just don't get substantiated with, with you know, proper research evidence, you know, scientific evidence to, to, to go out and say there's actually something going on here rather than, you know, something just as strong as placebo um, and so I think I think it's uh, so important so what what, what did you find uh, well how did you go about running your research and, and 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 yeah yeah I guess I mean just to start a little bit I mean yoga is something that we do here often you know it's great for stress reduction go and do it and as you said sometimes the evidence isn't always there when we talk about these practices but yoga is interesting isn't it because it combines physical exercise which most most of us working in the field of psychology would say is really important for well-being and you know has demonstrated antidepressant and anxiolytic effects and then yoga combines mindfulness which is another area that more and more research is supporting the benefits of mindfulness on well-being and mood and positive effect and then also we add into it breathing exercises and controlled breathing is something that has long been used in the field of psychology. So yoga brings these three areas together. So perhaps it's not surprising that a practice that combines these three evidence-based approaches itself did, um, did show a beneficial effect. So essentially add one what as well? I found in the... Sorry, hmm, can I add one as well? I know that yoga is often... Um, uh, uh, some of the people participate in classes. So there would have to be, at least if in the class environment, a very strong community or a sense of connection with others. And, and, and I know that connection is just, you know, stupidly important. It's, it, it's, it's a wildly a human need. You know, it's something that, that just changes everything. You know, the research is it's plentiful there. Um, was your research on individual practice? Uh, was it? No, on, it was on a group practice and they group. actually kept journals and it was really interesting because relationships were, were formed between the participants in the class as well. So it's interesting that you bring that up because I agree, you know, social isolation is something and you know what, we're, we're in lockdown in different parts of Australia right now and globally. So this is something that I think we're probably even more acutely aware of right now, but social connectedness is something hugely beneficial for well-being. So I think you're right. And, you know, interestingly, Nesh, when I did that yoga class, when I just moved cities, so the second dingy class I did, you know, one of the, the most important things I found there was, you know, I just moved to this new place and the yoga studio actually called me the next day to check in on how my class was. It was the first time anyone had called me on this new mobile number. And I was like, wow, you know, like someone's noticed me and cares. And I actually developed quite a social circle from that practice. So, wow. you know, from my experience as well, I think that's really an important point. So for sure. So I think that that's another area that we probably need to consider. And I think the benefits that I'll talk through with yoga, you know, from a biopsychosocial perspective, you know, that biologically and physiologically, the benefits we see, I think will hold, you know, whether we're doing our classes on Zoom or not, or doing it in our living room, I think there's probably benefit in tuning into ourselves and cultivating that sense of interoception, which just means the ability to sense where our body is at space and what's going on with us, because the more we can tune in, the more we can start cultivating the sense of self-regulation. But in a class where we might be kind of connected energetically with the people around us and beside us, there's an incredible benefit to that sense of flow with another individual. 
It's, uh, it's interesting that talking about that, that sort of kinesthetic awareness, uh, being, being in touch with, you know, space and, and um, you know, location of space of your body and the like and how that connects with uh, self-regulation or emotional regulation. Can you talk about that a little bit for, for, for some of our listeners? For sure, for sure. So when we are in a state of distress, often what's happening is we're moving into a fight or flight, a panic response. So what happens when we are, and this obviously goes beyond in trauma, but we'll start with the fight or flight, the panic response. When we move into a panic mode, our body starts to tell us to move, that we need to do something, we need to change the situation, right? So our heart rate starts going, our breathing starts going, we start to feel really warm, we start to feel really uncomfortable, perhaps in our bowels, and we start to have trouble thinking clearly. And all of this makes sense, because if there's a tiger running for us, we want to get away from that tiger. So increased blood is going to go to our arms and our legs so we can like propel and get ourselves out of there. We don't need to be digesting breakfast because we're about to be lunch. So getting that blood out of the digestive system makes sense. That's not there for survival. And we don't need to be doing high level math sums and all of the high level thinking that the prefrontal cortex, the front part of our it's us to do. So blood is actually being diverted away from our brain because we are in this primal response. So that, that experience feels really, really uncomfortable. It's designed to, because if we didn't feel uncomfortable, we might not have that energy and that gusto to move away from the tiger. The thing is that a lot of the stressors we experience in life today are not tigers. You know, having that same response when I I'm talking to a boss or I'm in a disagreement with my partner or trying to figure out how I need to progress this project at work, that response feels incredibly uncomfortable and isn't actually all that helpful. So some of the ways that we try and manage that is to disconnect from our bodies. You know, we might try really hard not to feel what's going on to distract ourselves, you know, whether it's by vegging out in front of Netflix, so we're not thinking about all the things or eating food or drinking or, you know, other behaviors that might be useful, maybe exercise might be something we turn to, but maybe we turn to the more unhelpful coping mechanisms. And, and that is a way of disconnecting from our body often. So we get out of sync with what's going on in our body. And then also, like I look around, you know, I, I live in a city, um, I look around and I see people wearing, you know, the six inch heels and carrying our bags on one shoulder. And like the way that we are living, often we're trying not to feel the feels that are happening in our body. So we're becoming more and more disconnected. Then I guess on the extreme end, people who might have, you know, experienced a trauma in their lives or had really um, significantly adverse experience happen when they're when they're younger um, or, you know, in a situation where they couldn't run or fight, they might move into a state of a freeze response. So a freeze response is where everything sort of shuts down in our body. And again, I like to think in evolutionary terms. So if we think back to that tiger kind of running on the savannah, if we think of an antelope, let's say, so this antelope is running away from the tiger and it's using that fight or flight response and it is in a full flight mode and the tiger goes and it's about to bite that antelope antelope, the antelope is not going to escape the tiger. Suddenly what you see is the antelope collapses to the ground and looks like it's dead. It looks like it's been got by the tiger, but it hasn't actually. So that is the freeze response and action there. It's unconscious. It's primal. It happens really quickly. The tiger then drags the antelope off and goes to get its cub. And in that time, the antelope can get up and run away. So again, it's a survival response. Alternatively, if the antelope did unfortunately get eaten, you know, not being connected to one's body in that moment is probably much better than the alternative. So us humans have that same response system as well. And if that's something that has been learned as a survival response in different situations, we might find ourselves what we call dissociating, disconnecting from our body. So learning to slowly and safely get back in contact with our body and the physical sensations, cultivating 
that sense of interoception, which is the word I used earlier, is really, really important because the more we can connect in with our body, the less likely we are to go to that full dissociative state. And the more we're able to regulate when we are in a fight or flight, a panic response. So it actually helps us to be able to connect in and physically feel the feels and start to use that awareness. And then our skills to start to move more into a state of relaxation if the environment is safe. So we're cultivating the ability to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest response. And I guess, you know, there's different ways that this can be done. So the vagus nerve, this is something that's quite topical right now. I'm sure you've heard lots, lots about it as well. Um, the vagus nerve is the primary nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. And what we're finding is that increased vagal tone. So that basically means the strength of the vagus nerve. So if we think like if we've got strong biceps, that allows us to lift heavier weights. If we've got stronger vagal tone, it allows us to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest response more easily, more quickly after we've had a stressor. So it doesn't mean that we don't experience stress and we don't have a panic response, but it means we can more quickly move into that state of relaxation so it has less wear and tear on our body. Because this is the thing, right? Every time we go into that fight or flight, every time our sympathetic nervous system takes the reins, we are increasing the load on our body. And this is why chronic stress in particular is so, so strongly associated with both physical and psychological illness because it's essentially creating wear and tear on our body over time. And we're not necessarily then spending the time in that relaxation response, that state of healing. So it's really important to appreciate that throughout, not even a day, throughout weeks, throughout months, potentially even years, we over time accumulate uh, a stress response that is an unconscious stress response of, of the, the tension, the load that I hold. And if, if I'm not doing something to release that, I'm staying for a longer period of time in the stress response rather than the rest and digest response. Um, and yoga is one of the, 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 the sort of ways that we can kind of begin to see that, you know, if we don't, there's a tendency to, I'm just trying to summarize this. There's a tendency to distract from those stressful feelings uh, and, Slightly over time, that distraction might look like physical things like, you know, looking at our phone or something, but we begin to actually disassociate or distance ourselves from feelings to try and cope. And so over time, we become less and less conscious, less and less aware, less and less connected with our feelings, but more stressed. I think so. I think so for sure. Like, I guess I'd be careful with um, saying that we learn to disassociate over time just because I think that that particular response evolves in a really intense situation, but for sure we disconnect from our feelings. Disconnect's a better word. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that, you know, you mentioned the phones, which is, I think an incredible point, you know, because we all know that we turn to our phones in these moments of boredom or stress or just when there's a lot and it's a way of yeah disconnecting from what's happening in the moment but the phones don't always reinforce us with like positive emotions or feels they can you know take us down these rabbit holes that actually don't feel that good and then perpetuate perhaps some of the unhelpful thoughts you know experiences we might be having and and then again we create that cycle of escapism Mm. So I think that's a really interesting response. I guess um, in terms of that load, so I would call it the allostatic load. So essentially our body is trying to maintain a state of homeostasis, like it's trying to find its place of balance. So it's trying to constantly regulate itself. And when we do go into those panic responses, that fight or flight response, that's essentially 
I guess it, it uses this thing called allostasis. The body is responding to the environment, to the situation, and that's the allostatic load, the wear and tear, which you know, makes, makes so much sense just sort of for listeners to have like an analogy to work with. If you're in a cold environment, you start shivering. That's your body's response to try and warm you up. It uses a lot of energy, but it keeps you alive. It keeps your body warm. And that's, that's sort of what's happening with this allostatic load that might be coming from the fight or flight response. And that, that doesn't happen individually. So it's connected systems in our body. So we talked about the tiger and we talked about how maybe having a meeting with our boss or, you know, maybe a difficult conversation with a partner might trigger this stress response. It can also be, you know, images that might cross our mind, thoughts that might cross our mind. It doesn't even have to be something that's happening in real time. So we can have this psychological event and it elicits the same response. So the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response goes on, but along with it, something called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis gets triggered, which is the hormonal system in our body. So there's this hormonal uh, response that starts. And these two systems being activated also send a message to our immune system that something's wrong. And that tells our immune system to, to get ready. And again, evolutionarily speaking, makes sense. If that tiger bit us, we'd want our immune system on to fight the bacteria that we might get and the infection risk that we might have in that moment. But again, if it's a psychological stress, if I'm imagining what could go wrong when I head to that meeting tomorrow, my immune system kicking in isn't that helpful. And it functions a lot like the boy who cried wolf, <laughs> you know, that story where the boy, you know, is watching his flock of sheep and he gets a bit bored one day. So he heads down to the city and he cries wolf, wolf, and all the villagers come running to help him. And then there's no wolf there. And he does that a few days in a row. And finally, like the third or fourth day, he heads down to the town and cries wolf and no one comes to help him. But the thing is that day there's a wolf there. And that's kind of what happens to our immune system. We're telling it something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. So it's releasing all of these cytokines. These are the little things in our body, they're little proteins, and it's essentially inflammation. And that inflammation is brilliant when it's going to fight bacteria or an infection or something that's, you know, invaded our body's system. So we want cytokines in those moments. But the thing is, if, if there's not much happening, having high levels of inflammation in our body is actually not that helpful. And high levels of inflammation are associated with a number of illnesses, including things like rheumatoid arthritis, where it gets trapped in the joints. So we know then that you know, we, we want to be mindful that our immune system is also getting triggered. And then with those high levels of inflammation for a period of time, they kind of burn out. So then we might get more sick actually after we ca maybe catch a cold when we've been in this period of high stress because we don't now have an immune response. Does that sort of make sense? Like it's this weird high and then drop off response that happens with our immune system, neither of which is ideal if it's not appropriate to what's actually physiologically, biologically happening. Is it kind of like the inverted U um, in terms of... Yeah, that's exactly if, what it's like. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, if there's sustained uh, immune response over a long period of time it, it, that's heightened, it, it starts to lose its efficacy. Um, there is a bit of a sweet spot, um, but also uh, it needs to be activated uh, from time to time because if it's very, very, very low, it's not prepared. And so it needs to kind of sit um, or at least at least have range in it and not stay at either of those as um, uh, I, I suppose too high or, or, or in some sense, not, not, not being activated much at all. Totally. And at, while we're talking about that inverted you, I think it's good to highlight that the same inverted you applies to stress because often when we talk about stress, it kind of gets a negative, a negative sway, doesn't it? You know, we're sitting here talking yes. about, Oh yeah, stress has all these <laughs> negative effects, but it, 
It's distress that has the negative effects on our system. Again, at a high level, or a, pardon me, a medium sort of level of stress is what we might call you stress, you just being the Greek word for good. And that is actually really adaptive. It leads to high performance. So we want to have some stress in our lives. We can all think of those days when we're on holidays and we have all these ideas of what we're going to do and we don't even get out of bed. We don't have enough for, like stress to kind of get us out doing the things. We need a little bit of stress to get things done, like a little bit of stress got us both here this morning. You know, we had our timers, we had our schedules. We need some stress in our lives to actually be effective. So I want listeners to be mindful that stress is not a bad thing. It's when we get to the state of distress where we're having symptoms of anxiety and depression you know this this state where things are no longer functional where we can no longer cope that's the state where we're more concerned so the idea of of uh you know the 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 yoga practice or even just being aware uh, being uh, i think you call it interoceptive um yeah uh, is, is being able to kind of observe oneself notice our feelings notice our our physical uh, self in in space allows us to to kind of connect again rather than disconnect to 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 to, to be is it a sense of security that we start to, to 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 notice is it that we start to allow for those feelings to be there a little bit more as a result what what what, what sort of function uh, how would you kind of describe what happens in that process I'll be mindful not to not to overstate something because I don't think we know exactly what the mechanism is as to how we how we see these effects. But what we what we do see is that people who engage in a regular yoga practice, so I can reference specifically my research, people were practicing yoga once or twice a week for an hour at a time. And it was a physically based practice of yoga. So using the physical movements, you know, that mindful meditation that comes with the physical movements and that awareness of breath. And over a period of eight weeks, people saw an increase in their positive effect. So this is like the feelings of positive emotions, um, you know, joy, happiness, feeling connected. These emotions were heightened and they were heightened long term. So what, what I mean by that is that in a month follow up, so a month after they'd ceased the yoga practice, they were still experiencing higher levels of positive effect and they experienced decreased levels of negative effects. So negative effect just means the, the emotions that we as humans seem to be less fond of, you know, so sadness or guilt or, you know, these more icky-ish emotions. What's really interesting is that in the period of the 60 minute yoga practice, by the end of that practice, Again, people experienced increased positive effect, not necessarily decreased negative effect in that 60 minutes alone, but increased positive effect. So while all the stressors that existed in your world are probably still there 60 minutes after you step onto the yoga mat, you're able to experience more of the good feels around it. So it kind of leads to this rebalancing. Also, what we see is a change in perceived stress. So while again, all the stressors might be there, you know, from one month to the next, after someone is engaging in a regular, you know, at least once a week yoga practice, once a week for an hour is not that much in the scheme of things, but they experienced increases in their perceived capacity to cope with the stressors in their lives. So I guess some of the thought as to how that might mechanistically um, be experienced is that as we learn to move our bodies, we're using our bodies as tools. We're seeing increased capacity perhaps in our strength and our flexibility and our understanding of what is our left foot and what is our right foot. So there's this increased capacity to mobilize to move but also to manage in a situation that's kind of uncomfortable right like stretching is not always the best sensation you know it can be a little bit uncomfortable and here we are breathing through an uncomfortable sensation so i kind of wonder if maybe part of the mechanism is that we're actually learning to be with uncomfortable emotional experiences, right? If we're like reaching for our toes and we experience an uncomfortable sensation in our body, we're not disconnecting, we're not picking up our phone, we're breathing into it and we're learning, oh, I can sit with this, I can 
be with this. This hasn't got the best of me, so to speak. I can exhale one more time. I can breathe in a little bit more. And it's changing. It's moving. It's not a forever. Because often when we think of uncomfortable emotions, we try and get rid of them really quick. And we don't actually realize, you know, the lifespan of an emotion is like, what, 60 seconds, 90 seconds? It's very quick if our minds don't jump in and judge and analyze and push away or respond or ruminate about something else. So in a yoga practice, you actually have this opportunity to experientially experience sensations in your body and emotions really are sensations in our body. And I imagine as well, and please, please correct me because I'm going to mess this up, but I imagine with uh, practicing yoga, when you do feel discomfort, there's potentially a, a tendency for that discomfort to move with the next maneuver so if you're holding a position for let's say 60 seconds or less or more um, when you do change your posture uh, you release the pain from one area and maybe shift it across to another uh, which kind of you know I, I suppose gives us a little bit of that experiential knowledge and and um, maybe even if i use the word you know uh, gently capacity or, or resilience to, to sit with that level of pain, um, maybe in that context, but there might be a generalizing effect too. For sure. I think, I think that's right. And I think we're both fans of ACT, aren't we? So I suppose yes, too, yes. like what's coming <laughs> along with this is the psychological flexibility. So, you know, I think one of the benefits of yoga is not like being able to touch our toes more effectively or, you know, to bend ourselves backwards or in half like pretzels. It's, it's actually being able to respond flexibly to what's showing up in the moment. You know, if I go into an asana, like a posture and I'm like, okay, this is uncomfortable. I can breathe through this. I can adjust a little bit here or there. I'm responding flexibly. And similarly, if people go into an asana, if I go into an asana a posture and I'm like, Oh, actually this is not the, not the sensation of stretching. This is, this is pain. Like this could be damaging. And I move back that's really reinforcing my ability to respond and to notice what's coming up in those moments. And that's a good thing when we go, oh, I'm practicing like ahimsa, which in yoga just means non-harm. We're not harming ourselves. And yet we're still putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations. There's so many parallels. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I, I get excited. So I like to make lots of connections, but uh, uh, it sounds like they, they, these are, uh, possible you know connections or at least ways to, to to discuss potential mechanisms of why yoga has so much so much value i mean we can't ever know scientific research we will struggle to know lots of these things and you know self-reports are a bit different but uh uh i, I know that some of your workers has, has also looked at epigenetic change as yeah. well which you know isn't isn't kind of you know self-report uh, not that there's anything wrong with that because that, that's powerful as well but maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, yeah, about that to. i'm not sure if i've jumped ahead a little bit too too, too quickly no, I, I think this relates really well so um, when we're sort of talking about that model i think it just so listeners have some context so we're not suddenly throwing in um you know these biological measures so what what happens is when we have that fight or flight, that panic response, or like a distress response stimulated, as I mentioned, it connects to our immune system and our immune system responds by releasing cytokines. So cytokines are these inflammatory markers. Now that creates this cyclical effect because when there are higher levels of inflammation in our body, interestingly enough, the barrier with our brain is such that our mind, our mind, our brain actually notices, oh, wow, there's more, um, more cytokines, there's more inflammation happening here. And our brain goes, oh, wow, okay, so we've got inflammation happening in the body, the immune system's kicked on, that must mean something dangerous is happening. So then it sends a message back to the sympathetic nervous system and the HPA axis so that um, I, I guess our um, endocrine response system and says something's going on, keep an eye out. So then we're primed again for this fight or flight, this distressed response, which again tells our immune system, like it creates this real cycle. And those cytokines, interestingly enough, are also a language that's used by the vagus nerve that we talked about, that nerve that's linked to the parasympathetic nervous system. So those cytokines 
send messages to the vagus nerve saying, oh, the immune system's on, things are a bit stressful in this body right now. Maybe you need to kick in, maybe you need to check in on what's going on. It might tell the vagus nerve, okay, like turn on. So specifically the cytokine that speaks between, which is, I guess, an inflammatory um, messenger is tumor necrosis factor. And that tends to be the most utilized message of the vagus nerve. So it's a really important one. So this whole system happens. However, what's happening kind of below it is our epigenetic system changes in response to stress. But just so listeners maybe understand, you know, we talk a lot about DNA and we've all probably heard about DNA, you know, turning us into these people that we are right now. The thing is that DNA actually doesn't speak for that much of who we show up as and our, our experience in this body. It tends to be our epigenetic system that actually tells which genes to turn on or off. So you can think of a tap facet. If you turn the water on, the water is going to flow. If you turn the tap off, the water is not going to flow anymore. So things that are happening in our environment tend to tell our epigenome essentially to turn certain genes on or off, which, um, which is really interesting. So environment tends to be something that, you know, is getting more and more um, reps for importance. And that environment might be in utero as a baby. It might be the, you know, air that we're breathing, the foods that we're eating, all of these things matter. So what we're do learning more and more is that actually things that happen in our environment short term can also have an epigenetic effect. So if we are in a really, really stressful, difficult situation, we are perhaps turning on genes that are associated with the higher levels of inflammation that we just talked about. So that's essentially where some of our systems are getting the message to increase those levels of inflammation. But also, you know, then associated with that might be illness, disease that comes with these experiences experiences. So it's quite complicated. It's not as simple as like one, one tap we turn on, but it's easier for analogy. It tends to be this triangulation effect. So what we looked at in um, the research I was involved in was looking at proteins in the blood. So those cytokines just in the blood peripherally, but also looking at epigenetic changes associated with the immune system. And we found not much happening in those bloods in the system. It tended to be that, I guess, when we were conceptualizing it, a lot of them bottomed out. So what that means is maybe our population wasn't as stressed as people who might be in more distressing situations, perhaps, you know, maybe things were, were tough, but were manageable in the scheme of how we were measuring these bloods. Though we did see like a little bit of change in something called interleukin-6, which is similar to tumor necrosis factor. So something was happening there. But we did see with the epigenetics that the tumor necrosis factor changed. So we saw a change in the epigenome at that particular receptor site. So that's really interesting. And I don't want to overstate what that necessarily means. Like it, it could be related to the vagus nerve and, you know, this hypothesis that one of yoga's mechanisms, when we're talking about mechanisms again, is through increased vagal tone, be it by like the compressing and stretching but also through that meditative effect that might happen, but something's happening there. So more research is definitely warranted in this area. I guess the, the trouble is, you know, it's quite expensive and where pharmaceutical companies will often pitch in and, you know, support different biological measurings where there is a product to be gained. There's perhaps less motivation for, um, for incredible funds for a yoga practice. But I think the fact that in sort of a small, you know, pilot study, we've seen something that's incredibly powerful to kind of contextualize it a little bit as well. There's also been epigenetic changes demonstrated in a day long meditation. So people that went and participated in an eight hour meditation retreat, also epigenetic changes were seen for that. So we know that these 
healthful well-being kind of activities that we're doing, they are leading to changes that are measurable at a cellular level, which is pretty cool. So if we know that stress has an effect, we try and balance it with something else, you know? It sounds, it, it certainly sounds extremely plausible. I know speaking with David Sloan Wilson recently, who's a, a evolutionary biologist, he was talking about, and I'm, I might sort of paraphrase this a little bit incorrectly, might have to go back to that, that podcast, but he was talking about um, some animal studies uh, and you know, observational as well within, within humans when um, children are brought up in high distress environments uh, that we can see the um, uh, puberty response uh, uh, occur earlier um, and that would kind of make a bit more sense and obviously sexualized behavior um, because if there's a threat in the environment evolu- from an evolutionary perspective it's important to go out and be able to um, uh, procreate uh, and and they've been able to, 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 to demonstrate that which kind of shows some pretty remarkable changes and I, and I believe and look this is where I'm probably stepping out of line i believe that might happen in utero as, as as well in terms of that that methylation of of particular genes um you know is priming uh, an offspring to to be ready for danger and um i'm, I'm sure it extends well beyond that but uh you know what, yeah. what, what you're saying you know it, it sounds very much in line with with, with those other types of studies so uh, it's, it's, sure it's and I, I can't think of the link of this but i think this will fit really well with that is i'd heard that there was a study done that was looking at again it was animal models i believe it was poor little rats um but they they took some rats and they they gave them the smell of cherry blossoms and whenever they smelt the cherry blossoms they would shock these rats So there became this adverse reaction to the smell of cherry blossoms, quite understandably. Then they looked at these rats' offspring, and I believe it was five generations down. If you gave those rats a cherry blossom to smell, they would have a panic response. So they, in their lifetime and in their parents' lifetime, in some cases and in their grandparents lifetime had never had an adverse experience associated with a cherry blossom but their wiring still responded in a way like it like it was a threat so i think that that's really interesting that what's happened to our parents and our grandparents matters you know and i think that's interesting as well to think you know people who maybe are are thinking of having kids or something like this you know, that what you do matters, you know, if you can make little changes in your life and, and change your epigenome and, you know, subtle changes might actually be handed down for generations to come, which is pretty cool. You know, we all have this ability to, to make transformation and we're not bound by what's happened for sure. We're, we're handed a deck of cards, so to speak, but we can change it. You know, I think that's what we're learning more and more about the epigenome is, is that it is something that's shiftable, you know, when you use the word methylation. So just so listeners kind of understand, that's one way of measuring epigenomic changes, um, which is kind of like a marker, just a flag that, um, that someone who's looking at the, the genome can actually see that, that these things are measurable, which is really cool. Yeah, are there any particular types of yoga practice that you're aware of that... Uh, are not necessarily better than others, but you know, w- w- ones that bring about these effects that we're looking at. Uh, is, is is there some commonality or, along the whole? Because I know there's, there's there's so many different yoga styles and, and and so on. Anything that you're aware of that we should look out for, or kind of go, it would be useful to. You know, make sure we integrate X into our practice. What, 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 what are your thoughts around that? This is very controversial. <laughs> Everyone who practices a style of yoga is pretty sure that their style of yoga is the best style of yoga. So I'm setting you up um, here. I'm setting you up. <laughs> I'm trying to like tread lightly. Um, 
I think, I think it's going to be individual, right? We're all different. We all have different things that we appreciate, that we value. So I think we want to find a practice that works for us. And I always, when people are asking, oh, what should I try or what should I do? I suggest going and trying a few different studios, a few different teachers and seeing really what vibes, because some people try yoga and they're like, this is adverse. I didn't like this. I didn't like that person. I didn't like this style. And then they don't go back. So maybe if you think of the fact that it's like a box of crayons, every color is a little bit different. One might feel better at a given moment in your life. You know, try, try them on for size and see what works. I suppose when we're talking about the research that I was involved in, and it's the only trial that's been done today with the epigenetic um, exploration. So um, that was a style of yoga that was physical in the sense of using some linked movements together. So it had a bit of what we would call a flow component to it of moving from one posture to the next, as well as some slower postures near to the end. But the idea of some of the, the dynamic elements of the practice was to get the heart rate up a little bit so that that cardiovascular benefit that comes with physical exercise could also be experienced pardon me, experienced in the yoga practice. So that was by design, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I'm a big fan of something called yin yoga, which is where you sit down in these postures for like five to seven minutes, because I think that meditatively and psychologically, it's a really interesting process to watch your resistance unfold. So I think that that can have different benefits as well. So I don't think there's a right yoga. There's not, there's just not a lot of research that's been done that's looked at these um, biochemical measures, what, you know, in, in Western science, we would call the gold standard measures because this is an area where, yeah, it, it's harder in terms of setting up the trials and, you know, taking blood from all the people, but, you know, it, it costs a bit of money and, and there's not necessarily that return that, um, that maybe, maybe there is in different, in different experiences or different trials that people are looking to kind of um, test and explore. So hopefully it will come in future and we could say, oh, for this, you know, concern or this challenge, you should try this type of yoga. And for this concern, try that type of yoga. But I don't think we have anything so sophisticated right now. So create your own adventure. Now I'm going to throw you another question that you're going to have to dodge, um, <laughs> but hopefully you'll be able to give me something. Uh, is, is, is there, and this is purely even uh, if it's just your opinion, uh, is there a, a time people should aim for? Like we clearly know that you know, five minutes is probably not going to cut it, so, so to speak, you know, and we, you know, it's fairly easy because otherwise everyone would do, you know, a five minute or a one minute practice and we'd all get all the wonderful benefits. Um, I'm not suggesting that there wouldn't be some benefit. I'm sure there would be even at that, at that level. Um, but I can imagine a lot of people might also say, oh gosh, you know, 60 minutes or, you know, 90 minutes. I, I, it's going to be too difficult for me to, to, to bring that into, in, into my day. And, and I know that, you know, we're both big proponents of, of, of flexibility and range and all that sort of stuff. But if we kind of tried to guesstimate, you know, what's a reasonable uh, a spot to aim for? And obviously there's going to be, you know, a margin, give or take. Everyone's got different context. Everyone's got a different lifestyle and so on. But from your own experience, you know, not even necessarily as a psychologist or a researcher, even as a, just a human being, what, what are your thoughts? Um, as a human being, it's interesting because I suppose, you know, when I started doing yoga, I was doing 90 minute classes every day and I was like, what's people's problem? Why can't they do this every day? And I was like in university in my twenties, totally self-centered and thinking, I don't understand. I remember like when I was teaching too, when I was younger, sometimes people would vanish for like years and then they'd come back and I'd be like, where have you been? And they're like, I had a kid. And I was like, I don't understand how that would influence things. And now, <laughs> now, you know, having softened with the years a little bit and um I so when I had my daughter I I was doing home yoga practices I had a very I still have the very sensitive daughter and I I had all these visions of going to these mums and bums yoga classes that were like an hour or 75 minutes and you know had this vision of my daughter playing beautifully on my yoga mat while I did these classes and she hated them like she emotionally um was very dysregulated and it didn't it didn't work for her didn't work for us so I started practicing at home. The, the challenge 
being. Um, also her um, attention span or capacity to entertain herself for a period of time was limited. And I started doing 15 minute classes. I found 15 minute classes online. So I didn't have to think about, you know, designing a sequence necessarily. Some days I would move according to my body and really focus on the interception, do like 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes I would just have someone else guide me through a 15 or 20 minute yoga practice. And I felt phenomenal at the end of that like that experience of having 15 minutes or 20 minutes for myself felt great and when it was a more dynamic practice I felt my heart rate going so I was getting some cardiovascular benefit you know not everyone chooses that style but that was what really worked for me at that moment in time and I think that fits because, you know, more and more we're learning that if someone goes for like a 15 minute run, that that is enough if they're doing it regularly to see the cardiovascular benefit. I think it's Kelly Wilson who goes, it's just getting off the couch that is the benefit. You know, it's not necessarily about doing a marathon or necessarily doing 60 minutes. If you can give yourself, you know, a chunk of time that you can tune inwards. And I think, yeah, 15, 20 minutes is enough time to be able to tune in and to check in with how you're going. So I think if you can give yourself that gift, that's a really nice place to start. And if you have the luxury of sneaking out to a 60 minute, a 75 minute, a 90 minute yoga class, brilliant. But you don't necessarily need that amount of time to be able to check in. I think it was also Kelly Wilson, and once again, I could could be saying this wrong too. Um, I think he was talking about uh, benefits also. Uh, you know, no doubt that increased heart rate helps and and, and the like, obviously with, with with great physical exercise. But I think he was also talking about uh, very similar um, benefits from range of movement you know like the, the the fact that we even put our you know arms above our head you know is something that we just don't do yet we see in children all the time you know children might crawl under a table and squeeze through somewhere and so it, it's kind of like a, a level of activity um you know using your body you know whether it's gardening or something where you're not necessarily increasing your heart but they're, 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 there's a lot more activation of your whole body and yoga does that, you know, it, it activates everything in, in each of those postures and in very different ways. Um, and I can see that, you know, you could add that component of, you know, where it might be a little bit more physically demanding uh, or, or, or it could be, well, heart rate wise, um, or it could be a little bit less, but it still uses, and obviously this, with my limited knowledge of yoga, still uses your whole body, um, you know, even if it's very centered on, you know, just concentrating on your breath and concentrating on maintaining a, a you know, a fairly, what we might call an easy, easy posture. There is still so much going on in the whole body, um, along with obviously focus. For sure. I think you're incredibly on the point there, Nash. And it, I guess with that too, it's done mindfully, right? So it's not like we're just throwing our arms over our head, like <laughs> we're, we're moving our arms over our head and we're going, ah, oh, I'm noticing this is experienced now. You know, I'm feeling different. This has shifted. So we're learning about how maybe moving our body in different ways feels different. And I think that's really useful data because then when you step off the mat, and you're in that uncomfortable conversation and you're noticing your jaw clenching and your shoulders hunching, we might then go, oh, okay, I'm noticing this happening. What happens if I drop my shoulders down? I lift my chest up. Maybe I might feel a little bit different in this situation. So I think it's useful data in that changing how we're physically um, posturing ourselves. And there is, there is research, isn't there, that has um, found emotional effects for how we position ourselves you know that there's like a strong um, posture that we can sit ourselves in where we might feel more confident versus if we are kind of curling in physically we actually might rate ourselves as feeling less confident in a situation not all that's changed is our physical posturing so there's this psychological connection happening as well i wonder if uh there might be a you know that a similar calming response that that that, that could be beneficial kind of more globally I, I i grind my teeth or clench my teeth you know in the mornings i might feel sore or i'll get a bit of a headache of of you know recently years um and uh you know obviously the traditional traditional uh, advice from from the doctor might be you know go to your dentist get a splint or something like that um uh 
do you think yoga is a, a good place to, to explore um, to see if, if I, I would be listening. interested. I think your wife should be listening in right now and going, well, <laughs> let's test this, Nash. Let's, let's get you to a yoga class and see what's happening with those teeth. <laughs> she would be loving You set this yourself right up. <laughs> we're, we're not publishing this one. That's it. We're, we're done. We're done. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll do a science experiment. We can do a case study. Let's, um, let's try <laughs> it. <laughs> research yeah, I mean, I wise, possible. Re- research wise, what do you think is next? I mean, what, if, if you had uh, another opportunity uh, to, to take this further, what would, you, what would you look into? And maybe this is a you know, call out to possible um, you know, PhD students coming, coming up. Uh, where, sure. would you, where would you take? I'm sure it's written up in, in, in your work in terms of the limitations mm-hmm. and, and, and the like, but where would you like to see things move next? I- I think, I mean, there's a few areas that I'm really interested in right now. So I suppose one area is exploring more of the epigenetic and the biological factors. And, you know, we talked a lot about the vagus nerve. So I think better understanding that mechanism would be really useful. You know, we also have hypotheses as to what's happening um, with the neurotransmitters in the mind. So there's been some suggestion that a yoga practice might enhance GABA. So GABA being an anxiolytic neurotransmitter in the brain. So just seeing how this cycle is working, whether it is the increased vagal tone, you know, and whether that's coming from the relaxation response in yoga, whether that's coming from the push and pull, that physical movement that you talked about, seeing how that's related and whether that's what's sort of affecting these um, changes we might see in, you know, neurotransmitters happening that could be then affecting our mood or how this whole system is connected. So I think, I think there's lots more room um, for research in the psycho neuroimmunological area, as well as the epigenetic areas. I think looking more at trauma sensitive yoga is really interesting. So there's lots of research coming out of the justice Institute in Boston um, around trauma sensitive yoga and the, uh, the effect that that practice is having on individuals who have had, you know, um, yeah, incredible trauma in their background, in their experience, and how this practice is helping them cultivate introception and make changes um, in their brain structures as well. So there's been some brain scans that have been done. I think that's an incredibly interesting area, and we could certainly benefit by learning more about that and learning about how it then connects in with psychological work and therapy. So um, I have ran some groups in the past that have incorporated yoga, mindful movement with acceptance and commitment therapy, because I think that pairing is really beautiful. So how we go about um, continuing to incorporate these areas that, that fit really well, because a seated meditation practice isn't appropriate for everyone. I think a physical sort of mindful movement practice, whether it's Tai Chi or walking or yoga, can be really useful at learning to be in the present moment in a way that gives us a fixation point that might feel less dangerous to someone than their own mind. So I think being able to notice that sensation of stretching or movement is incredibly powerful. And I think therapeutically, it'll be really nice to know how we um, most effectively combine mindful movement, combine yoga, in our work that we're doing as psychologists. And Caitlin, I'm just mindful of time as well. I know you've got a little one to, to, to attend to. Uh, listeners often also like to know uh, what are our guest practices uh, themselves? So how, how do you practice? Obviously, you've got a busy lifestyle. There's a little one, a family, you know, all the bits and bobs of, of running a household and the like. How and, and, and when do you get to you know, practice yourself? Yeah, so ideally, I sneak out to a yoga class because that is an incredible environment to be in. Um, so I like to try and get out to a yoga class at least once a week if I can. You know, it doesn't always happen. And if, if it's a great week and things are flowing, sometimes I'll get out twice a week. Think back to that university self and I think, oh, you were so lucky. Um, 
And then I, I practice at home. So that's just like rolling out my mat. And, you know, if I'm the first one up, I can do a few moments in the morning by myself of just moving and breathing. And, and sometimes if I'm trying to be really quiet, I just tune in and see what's going on in my body and move and respond accordingly. If I'm feeling risky, I close the door and turn on um, a video of a teacher that I, I like and I resonate with so that I have that outside stimulus and that guidance that I, you know, I, I guess I find that really helpful as well. So I'll do a, a class video and then really it's flexible. Like when it's, it's nice out here. So those of you who are not in North America, so it's turning to summer in Australia. And this is the best time of year for me to practice with my daughter, because if we're outside, she can look at things and I can put the mat down and actually do my yoga practice with her. And I think that that's really powerful in terms of messaging because she'll get on the mat and do a little yoga down dog, she calls it. And I think that that's a nice habit to pass on. So honestly, it's like 20 minutes a day that I'll do um, sometimes more if I get out and sometimes sometimes it's really just a seated mindful moment but for the most part it's a 20 minute sort of flow beautifully said with so much flexibility in there and that's what makes it so beautiful I, I imagine that's exactly what what the philosophy of yoga is also trying to instill you know I know that there is a discipline in the practice but at the same time it's it, it's also you know, uh, upholding flexibility and, and, and being um, adaptive and alike and, and you know, similarly, uh, so is ACT. So um, yeah, be be beautiful synergy there. Oh, thank you. I think, um, I think that's been a learning over the years, probably as all the practices in my life have kind of brought us to this point. And I hope that is helpful for listeners because you don't, you don't have to be doing a handstand or a handstand for, you know, 60 minutes or something like that. You can start where you're at and, you know, like Nesh said, putting your arms over your head, bringing them back down, maybe doing the inhale up, exhale down, maybe doing that a few times is where you start your yoga practice. And that's a beautiful place to be fantastic thank you very much caitlin for for your time and your expertise and and also for your amazing amazing research it's nice to know there's empirical evidence that is tying these things together so that you know all, all the all the great practices you know going around the world can can go back and point to something and say you see it does work you know you should come along and come for it come for a lesson uh, which yeah you know, get to do one day <laughs> well, I, um, I'm excited to hear your feedback from your yoga <laughs> class and to hear how it works for your um, clenched jaw. So yeah, let's connect soon. Sounds good. Thanks again. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you